it is a pleasure for me to welcome to the Oktoberfest of Munich everybody coming from United States of America. I think Munich people are big friends of American citizens. I hope you enjoy this in Oktoberfest. And here we go, Oktoberfest 1981. Every year for 16 days, thousands of visitors converge on the Bavarian capital for one of the world's most unusual festivals. I suppose you could say it's like the Mardi Gras, the Fourth of July, and the World's Fair all rolled into one. And tonight, we're going to find out all about Oktoberfest. Danke schön. Hi, I'm Herb Glover. Welcome in to Gas House Goes to Munich. In the minutes ahead, we're going to uh, get very close to Oktoberfest. We're going to see some of the sights, and we're going to have some very interesting people visit with us. And one of those people is with us right now. Meet, please, Vicki Veller from the City of Munich Tourist Office. Vicki, welcome into our guest house. I would really say this is probably the world's largest guest house. Yes, I think it is. Vicki, there's a question that's always puzzled me, and that is, why in the world does Oktoberfest start in September? Well, the weather here is so unreliable in fall that we have to have it as early as possible, and we always have it in September, and it just has to go in a few days into October so that we can still call it Oktoberfest. There's so much tradition in the air here. How far back in history does this go? Well, it goes back to 1810, when a king called Ludwig I married a German princess called Theresia von Sachsen, and uh, this, this wedding was, every wedding anniversary was celebrated as a folks fest. And eight years after the wedding, it became officially a beer festival. So from 1818 onwards. So it was originally a wedding festival. That's, right. That's amazing. There's so much tradition, as we were saying, and one of those traditions is the opening Sunday parade. Would you tell us about it? Yes, well, the uh, Sunday parade is perhaps even a bigger event than the actual opening day on Saturday. Now, the parade is starts in the center of the city, and it's a folklorical parade, and uh, since a few years back, the, uh, also other countries, the neighbor countries, Italy, Switzerland, and so on, they're all the sent participants to in this, and they're all dressed up in folklorical costumes and parade through the city and end here. Now, on Saturday, when the fest starts, we saw the Lord Mayor of Munich come out here and tap a beer keg. Is that a traditional opening? Yes, it is. Uh, the, all the owners of the beer halls, they all come in, a, in four strong carriages through the city. Mm -hmm. They end here at the Oktoberfest, and the actual opening takes place here in this tent, the Schottenhammel tent. And the Lord Mayor, he has to open the first beer keg. It holds 200 liters of beer. My goodness, and look at the crowd in those pictures there. Now, there's a familiar face. Who is that? Well, that is Franz Josef Strauss, our minister president. So there are a lot of politicians and, yes, and but dignitaries. He, he has to be here because it is a tradition that he drinks the first liter of beer. Vicky, for a city with a million and a half residents, I suppose Oktoberfest doubles or triples the population here. Uh, can you give our American visitors uh, some advice on how to get around in the city? Yes. Well, I just first want to tell you that, that we have about five and a half million visitors here during the Oktoberfest. My goodness. Just for Oktoberfest. And of course, it is a, a problem to get the people out to the Oktoberfest. And the city has allowed to encourage people to leave the cars in town or at home. They have put in extra street cars. There's a very, very good Streetcar system, the subway, there's the S-Bahn, the Hakabrücke, and also the U-Bahn comes very close to here. Uh -huh. So it's very easy to get out it here. It's very easy, yes. Did you have any idea how much food and beer is consumed during this big festival? Well, about 40,000 liters of beer is consumed. Really? And about half a million of chicken <laughs> and 300,000 pairs of sausages. That's amazing. Is the word Gemütlichkeit applicable here? What does that word mean? That's hard to translate, yes, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's in fact impossible in any language to translate exactly. But Gemütlichkeit belongs to Bavaria, the Bavarian dialect, and I would say it means um, uh, a combination of, of the Umpapa music, the, the, <laughs> the uh, traditional, the folklore, the costumes, the yodeling, and also the, um, what means a really a cozy atmosphere. Vicky Prost. Thank you. Zum and thank you so much. You've made us feel very welcome thank in your you. city. Vicky Veller from the Munich City National Tourist Office, and she has made us feel very welcome here in Munich. Um, in addition to this Gemütlichkeit that Vicky was talking about, of course, one of the main ingredients of any Oktoberfest is its beer. And I'm telling you, we have found out here today that the Bavarians take their beer very seriously. And we're going to check that out in just a moment as Gasthaus goes to Munich. Freude, 
You know, it really takes all kinds of people to make an Oktoberfest. For example, this guy has been a fixture at the fest for many years. Some people think he's an oddball, but uh, we think he's a colorful character. He calls himself Fogel Jakob, or Bird Jakob. He invented, manufactures, and demonstrates a whistle, which he says is guaranteed to imitate any song the bird can sing in the entire world, provided, of course, you practice using it for about 10 years and don't swallow it in the process. Yes, old bird Jakob has become a part of the atmosphere here at the Oktoberfest. <laughs> My name's Alan Stuckey, and I'm stationed at the 1st Infantry Division Forward in Gerping in Germany, and I've been here about a year now, and this is my first time at the Oktoberfest, and so I have two more years to go, and if, if I can make it the last two years, I'm going to do it for sure, because this is a lot of fun. Everybody should try and come here. You know, there's an old saying here in the city of Munich that uh, goes something like this. A man who doesn't care which beer he drinks might just as well not care about the bread he eats. Now that has a, a real meaning to the people here in Munich because in this city, beer is known as liquid bread. We're going to find out about that and uh, some of the other intricacies of brewing beer right now. We have a real expert. I want you to meet here as Gasthaus goes to Munich, Dr. Johann Daniel Gerstein. He's the export manager for the Lubenbräu Company. Welcome into Gasthaus goes to Munich, sir. Thank you. Dr. Gerstein, why in Munich is, is beer known as liquid bread? Uh, it's a long time and a long story. Not only the Münchners, also the Bavarians call beer liquid bread because beer, of course, contains, as bread does, carbohydrates, egg white, and uh, they used it whilst they were working and sweating, especially mm. in olden times, the bricklayers and so on. They used it as a substitute for bread and it gave them a very good excuse because they said, we need this <laughs> like we need bread, you know. Dr. Gerstein, we've heard about two different kinds of beers. We've heard about top fermented beer and bottom fermented beer. What's the difference? The difference lies mainly in the yeast on bottom fermented beers like this one here, for instance. This is bottom uh, fermented? Yes, yeah. that is bottom fermented. If the fermenting process takes place, the yeast goes to the bottom of the fermenting vessel and the beer is then removed. Whereas on top fermenting beers, the yeast goes on top of the fermenting vessel, is then scanned off, as we say, and then you have the beer. Is, is one better than the other, or uh, what is the characteristic? No. The top fermented beers is the vice beer, which is in summertime more refreshing mm -hmm. and uh, there barley malt and wheat malt is added whereas on bottom fermented beers we have only barley malt. You know visitors to the Oktoberfest are introduced to a special fest beer. Is this the fest beer? This is fest beer. Uh, what's yes. the characteristic of fest beer? Uh, the fest beer has uh, more malt than uh, the normal beer it's slightly stronger in alcohol and slightly stronger in birth, and it lies longer in the cellars of the brewery, approximately one month or two months longer than uh, the normal export beers. And it's introduced every year at the October. Uh, every though. year, yes. Dr. Gerstein, can, can you give us some idea of how many beers might be brewed in Bavaria, let's say? Uh, hundreds. Hundreds. <laughs> we alone brew. 20 different kinds of beer, including that in some states they have special regulations and we must have less alcohol or more alcohol. So the wide variety of different beers is very typical for a Bavarian brewer and we are proud to serve a beer which fits for every need, be it diet beer, bock beer, and uh, pilsner beer, you name it. You know, one time I took a trip through your yeah. brewery and I met a, a Braumeister. He, Braumeister, Braumeister yes. he's a very yeah. special person. What is his function? He's sort of the man in charge, isn't he? Well, the Braumeister is uh, the most important. I'm not, unfortunately or fortunately, I'm not a Braumeister, but the Braumeister is or the Braumeisters are the backbone of the brewery. Uh, they are responsible for everything, for it starts from buying the right raw materials. It starts then from fermenting the beer, mixing it rightly, putting the right brew together. And then, of course, at Löwenbräu, 
each and every batch of beer is tasted physically by the responsible brewmaster. So he's a quality Still, control man, isn't also he? Also a quality control man, but also responsible for the producing. You know, Americans like to drink ice cold beer. Germans sell us all the time, it's a bad habit. But uh, I noticed when I was in a Gasthaus recently in Bavaria, as the, as the drinkers got their beer stein, they stuck a hot, a red hot poker into the beer to heat it. Now, why in the world do they do that? Well, uh, we think, personally, I joined this thinking that the uh, Americans tend to, uh, may I say so, to consume the beer much too cold. If it is cold, the flavor doesn't come out. Uh -huh. And uh, the warmer it is, we think the proper temperature is between 10 and 14 degrees Celsius. Uh, then really the taste, the flavor, and all the art which the brewmaster has put into the beer comes out. Whereas if it is ice cold, it doesn't come out. It's just another liquid. Uh -huh. And therefore, I suggest and I strongly recommend also for health reasons, better for your stomach, isn't it, Herb? Uh, uh, to have it a little bit warmer. <laughs> I'll have to try that. Dr. Gerstein, thank you so much for being our guest here as Gasthaus goes to Munich. You ask any Münchner and they'll tell you that the best beer in the world is brewed right here in Bavaria. And the best beer in Bavaria is brewed here in the city of Munich. And if the number of people who visit Oktoberfest is any indicator, they just might be right. In a moment, here as Gasthaus goes to Munich, we're going to be an American who has had a 15-year love affair with Bavaria. So don't go away. not the only liquid consumed at Oktoberfest. This tent, for example, is devoted exclusively to coffee and cake. Sergeant Weissman, the United States Air Force, signed at 6913th in Augsburg, Germany. Oktoberfest is pretty good this year. We came out in force, a lot of Air Force people are here. We're gonna enjoy it this time all the way down the line. You know, for many years, AFN listeners and viewers have become familiar with the voice of a man uh, every Friday and Saturday who gives us a driving conditions throughout the Federal Republic on the weekend traffic report. Well, right now, we want our television viewers to meet the man behind the voice. We're riding in a giant Ferris wheel above the Oktoberfest grounds with Mr. Neil Fontaine, the station manager of our AFN affiliate in the city of Munich. Hi, Isn't this Herb. beautiful? Hey. This is fantastic, Neil. Neil, I swore you'd never get me on one of these things. Look, Herb, I swore you'd never get me on one of these things, but wait till we get on that roller coaster. <laughs> Neil, I've often heard you say that Munich is your favorite city in the whole world. Why is that? It's a funny thing, Herb. You feel at home in this town almost immediately as soon as you come here. For most Americans, it's a terrible transition to come from back home, wherever it is, Indiana, Texas, Minnesota, Georgia, wherever, and all of a sudden be planted down in a foreign environment. But there's something about this town that is so warm and so friendly that you have to feel at home in a very short time. Now, you've really gone native. Look at what you're wearing here. Would you describe your outfit for us? Well, this is a Tegenseer Trachtenanzug. Now, what does that mean? It means that almost any place that you go in Bayern, there are minor differences in how the suit is cut. This one is from the Tegenseer Tal, down by the Tegenseer Lake. There's the Salzburger type that's cut just like a normal jacket with reveres, but normally gray with dark green reveres around here. And there's the Munich type, which doesn't have these, these uh, folded back and buttoned back reveres, just a little small collar. And also it depends on what tie you're wearing, where you're from. Uh, Munich people normally wear the, uh, the blue-white Rauten thing, like yeah. the Bavarian flag. Uh, normally you wear something like this, uh, a paisley as you can see, normally red. How long did it take you to acclimate yourself to Bavaria when you first came here many years ago? That's a funny thing. 15 years ago when I came to Bavaria, the day I arrived here, I felt at home. I took a drive from Munich south towards the mountains, and they're half an hour from here to get into the middle of the Alps. 
and all of a sudden a view, it was a day something like this, but a little clearer down south, and I had a view of those mountains, and I said, my God, I feel at home. And I've never regretted it. That was the day I flew over from Chicago to, to look at this job, whether I wanted it. And I've never regretted doing it 15 years ago. Neil, you've been very uh, actively involved in a variety of German-American friendship uh, ventures through the years here in Munich. How would you characterize the Bavarians? What, what kind of people are they? Herb, I think the best way to do it is to draw a parallel. Uh, I would say something like this. Bavaria is to Germany like Texas is to the United States. <laughs> they're individualists, they're warm, they're friendly. They will meet you more than halfway if you give yourself a little uh, trouble and try and meet them. If you speak a little German, oh boy, does that ever help, because they will knock their brains out to try and communicate with you. Well, now, I speak a little German, but I'll tell you, here at the Oktoberfest, I've tried to communicate with some of the Bavarians, and I swear, Neil, they got their own language. Could you give us an example of how Bavarian differs from Hochdeutsch or regular German? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that's a game with me. It has been for years trying to compare the different dialects, but in Munich or in Bavaria, it's a completely different thing because not only is it a dialect of Hochdeutsch and German, it's a completely different language. You cannot say that Bavarian is a dialect because they use different words for different things that uh, are normal in German. Nur, uh, zum Beispiel. Zum Beispiel. Oh, now we're getting into that. Uh, <laughs> A house in Hochdeutsch, das Haus, in Bavarian, is Häusle. Uh, you must love Bavarian food. I know every time I come down here, I eat well. Look at my stomach line. <laughs> I'll guarantee you I love Bavarian food, and there's so much of it. Uh, to characterize Bavarian food, I would say it's hearty, kräftig, wie man sagt in Deutsch. Uh -huh. um, Pig's knuckles, what we would call pig's knuckles at home, but it isn't really that. It's a roasted uh, knuckle of a pig. And uh, they're roasted on a grill, and the outside skin is so crackly and hard that sometimes you need an ax to get through it to really <laughs> enjoy it. What are some of the sights that Americans who are coming down here from the American military community can see, other than Oktoberfest? Well, Munich, first of all, is one of the most beautiful cities in Germany. It's a Baroque city. There are so many buildings that were built in the 17th, 18th century, and Bavaria has their former ruling house, the Wittelsbox, to thank for that. Ludwig I, uh, he built the Königsplatz here in Munich with these beautiful antique Greek buildings. The, the Baroque buildings in the town are so gorgeous. There are art museums that are the equal in the world. The Alta Pinacothek here in Munich is the equal of the Prado in Madrid or of the Tate, or the Royal Museum, the British Museum in England, or the, or whatever, or the Louvre in Paris. There are things in there that are so worth seeing. There's one of the finest opera houses in the world, a, a, a classic opera house built originally around 1817, 1818, that is in perfect condition. They have a wonderful company. They have guest stars from all over the world, from the Met, from La Scala in Milan, from everywhere that opera is great, they're here. But the art, the beauty of the city is what makes it so warm and wonderful, I think. Neil, I've enjoyed this Ferris wheel ride. Here we are above the city of Munich, above the Oktoberfest grounds, and uh, I want to thank you for joining us and telling us about your love affair with Bavaria. Well, it is really a love affair. It's 15 years, and I have never regretted one minute of it, really. Thank you. Now you know what he looks like, Neil Fontaine, our affiliate station manager in the city of Munich, and uh, our engaging host here as Gasthaus goes to Munich. <laughs> people we've talked to say they come to the Oktoberfest and they never eat or drink a thing. Their favorite sport, they tell us, is people watching. With all the costumes and trinkets and the color and the characters here at the fest grounds, we're told by reliable sources that people watching, if it continues to grow, could become an Olympic sport. I'm Kevin Fermanek. I'm stationed at the 56th Field Artillery Brigade in Swabish Gamun. And uh, I'm having a pretty good time here. This is my third third year in Germany. It's my last chance for an Oktoberfest. I'm glad I came. But it, uh, it's a lot of fun and uh, a lot of good food and beer. And uh, I'm 
really having a good time. Daniel, stationed in Augsburg, 328 ASA Company. The fest is real nice. Love to be here. What more can we say? We came, we saw, and we very much enjoyed sharing the short visit to Munich's Grand Oktoberfest. We want to remind you that the fest will be continuing through Sunday, the 4th of October. Now, just uh, to recap, if you come by car, we advise you again to park in the suburbs and take the city's rapid transit system into the fest grounds. You can take uh, any of the streetcars to Goetheplatz, and from there is a very short walk to the festival grounds. If you sample the beer, we advise you to go a little easy, and if you drink, don't drive. And the Bavarians, well, I think you'll find them to be warm, outgoing, and fun-loving, and willing to share a lot of their fun with you. We gotta go now, along with our producer, Navy Petty Officer Ron Hester, and our photographer specialist, Bruce Scott. I'm Herb Glover, thanking you for sharing these few minutes with us as Gas House goes to Munich. Good night. <laughs>